I'm Saida Pagan. All across America, millions are grappling with mental health issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, and dementia. Well, now there is a new documentary produced and directed by network television anchor Richard Louie that shows the real impact of caregiving on families, everything from the financial burden to the physical and emotional toll. I recently sat down with Richard to talk about his new film, Unconditional. I'm Richard Louie, live in New York City. I'd been a journalist for 15 years, and then my dad got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It's my son, Richard. Good to see you, too. It was a lonely road until I found others. The oncologist said that it looked like somebody had taken Kate and dipped her in cancer. We know he struggles with brain injury. The VA actually considers him 350% disabled. Constant alertness, watchfulness, inability to sleep. Sometimes he wakes up crying. Boom, my mind was a mess. In this house, we say the word cancer, cancer. It with a little lilt in our voice, but he knows that something's not good. You dig it? Hey, Pastor Louie? I'm not ready to be a single parent. If you recognize me, blink once. You only get one of these in a lifetime. Love you. Love you too. The reason that I can carry on, it's because of family, community, and love. Hello, and welcome to American Stories. Our guest today is Richard Louis. He is an MSNBC, NBC anchor. He's an author and a filmmaker. He directed and produced Unconditional, and according to what we're hearing, it premiered earlier this year, and it is uh, the most widely distributed documentary in 2023. Welcome to our program, Richard. Saida, thanks for having me. Yes, I saw the movie. I found it to be intelligent and deeply moving. Tell us what Unconditional is all about. It's a really tough topic. Um... It's about mental health and caregiving, but also about uh, how we can get through it and rediscover what love might be in in the everyday lives that we have with our families and with our friends. Tough topic. It was not what we set out to do in, in the beginning. Really? Now, this term unconditional or this title... Uh, hmm seems to me unconditional love. Is that what you were um, aiming for? Uh, yes, unconditional love, unconditional strength, unconditional giving, uh, unconditional um, ideas. And um, it's actually not the, the, the running title of it, Saida, was not even this. We changed it at the last minute. It, it drove a lot of folks a little nuts in the team. The original name was Hidden Wounds. And the reason why we shifted to Unconditional was because we really did believe it fit the energy that, uh, that the film was showing. And what we wanted to show to people is that there's joy despite difficulty. There's some good things that happen amongst um, this experience that all of us are either going through, went through, or will go through. And, and it's so easy to stay in the difficult stuff. And so we changed it from Hidden Wounds, although that, that is, a, um, I think, an okay title. Unconditional really exemplified the energy and the soul and the intent of it. And um, we also felt that um, the, the idea of, what we're trying to get across was that important. So although we had to change everything, like the the, the poster and the marketing of it, um, we knew that was truer to our hearts. Now, without giving anything away, we're talking about military families as well as caregivers for uh, those who have Alzheimer's. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what we might see in this documentary? You'll see three families um, that are different um, in age and time in uh, in the uh, the battles that they're facing and also in the laughs and the cries that they have along the way. And it's a very intimate um, but encouraging and I think um, identifying it, uh, of that you're not alone. I think that's the one thing everybody will see in this is, oh, that's me. I've been through that. I can identify with that. And, uh, and about something that we don't talk about out loud, yet we live it. And I think whether you're young or old, east, west, north, south, wherever you're from, when no matter your background, you'll go, hmm, I, I didn't know that that was actually what I was going through or that my loved one or my friend had gone through. And so I think that's the surprising thing about the film is you go into it thinking, oh, that may not be me, right? That's somebody that's like that, that age or from that part of the country, or that's a different sickness or that's a different success, a different triumph. And then you'll leave, I hope, seeing that, oh, I see that. I understand now. I think what struck me uh, after seeing the movie or the film that is, is that it was very uh, real and it was something that we do not see every day. Did you expect to see hmm. these types of uh, scenes that really are universal to all of us, but yet yeah. we don't always see? I did not. Yeah. Uh, Saida, when we started this, it was... Um... It was um, an un unknown outcome, but I knew it hadn't been done before. I knew we haven't spent time to look at mental health and caregiving and to look at mental health as a, men as a strength, as, a, as an ability, as a muscle that, that, that as you see in the families, you know, because it's also often cast as, oh, that's a problem and it can be, but also can be a strength. I didn't know that at the beginning. I didn't know that we were going to move down the road of really talking about mental health, something that affects 100 million Americans every year. That was surprising to me. And so I was exploring in the film because it also has and an not I did not really want to have my my own family's journey in it. But at the end of the day, and, and I think you and I share that, you know, we're, we're journalists because we tell stories. We didn't we don't want to go, hey, look at me. And. I realized I was inspired by uh, a Wall Street Journal journalist uh, who had also shared his own story taking care of his son. And that gave me the, okay, all right. Uh, if, it, if it makes the story stronger, let's do it. And so there was a lot of unknowns, me being, my family being in it and, ex and exposing basically what we're going through, both you know, emotionally, uh, financially, um, physically, that was not an easy thing for me to do. And um, ending up where we ended up took seven years. So um, I also didn't expect it for, to take that long. I didn't expect us to take two years to edit. Um, I always would think, you know, you and I coming from broadcast news, I was thinking, well, why would it take you that long to do that? I mean, we turn around a story in hours, right? We edit it, we put it up on, uh, up on on TV or or streaming. It's done. And so for me, just the editing process being two years was just mind blowing. I felt that you um, going back and showing your own personal story was quite powerful. Um, I'm I'm so glad that you decided to keep that in there. Three years ago, when I first uh, yeah. interviewed you, mm -hmm. we were talking about uh, Sky Blossom. Yeah. So now we're unconditional. Tell me about that that journey from documentary one to documentary two. Documentary one, which was about, and I thank you for having that conversation three years ago. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, piece that you did on on that journey of Sky Blossom, which is about young caregivers, uh, children um, aged 11 to 26. 
And that purpose of that one was to show it's not about just people my age that's going through it, right? You have 11 through 26 year olds who are the leader of the family in many ways. And how, how great is that to see that beauty? And when it came to unconditional, it was a deeper, uh, deeper is the wrong word to say. It was a different perspective of the way the whole family unit went through it. And we spent more time with each family. So it was a, it was a longer arc of time in unconditional to talk about. And we also talked about mental health very specifically. Sky Blossom was about showing this isn't something we all go through. Unconditional is about, well, it's also we all go through it through me our mental health and strength, which is an important topic to attack. So when you watch the two of them, I think they have different, um, I believe they have different um, emotional points and um, they, they cycle differently. But since I'm the director of both, they, they also have maybe a similarity in language uh, in some cases, not all, all the way through. I was curious as to how you connected with the two families that you profiled in the documentary. Well, uh, the Bouchats family, Amy Bouchats is a journalist as well. And I had reached out to her um, as an expert on covering this space of caregiving. Um, and I did this, I guess, six years ago, seven years ago uh, with her. I did not expect that I would be then asking her if they wouldn't mind being one of the subject families. But I, she was so clear and open about their physical and mental health journey and also were balanced in terms of being able to express the joy despite difficulty i said you you're if you don't mind your family would be perfect to share the story with others that it will make it um, just, just being very straightforward making it through the screen so that people would want to see it she was so good at that um and then the second family which was uh, the thomas family i had interviewed uh kate thomas five years before as somebody who was talking about uh women in the military and she was also a marine um and so um i found her through that connection uh, and through another organization, you know, all things just seem to cross at the right time. So that's how I, I, I'd met both of them initially. And so I thought it made sense after I looked at their, their families. And then as, as we were deciding about my family, I think it was, if the little bit of stuff that you and I do say to, uh, on camera can help bring attention to the topic, then let's do it. And that's, at the end of the day, why I decided it's okay to include my family and include what I'm doing. It's, it's kind of a, a journalist's journey. Yes. Now, talking about production, moving on to production, I know that when you did Sky Blossom, you were very committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. And I understand you were able to continue with that into your second documentary. Yes, super important. And not only behind the camera with the core crew uh, being 100% female and of, uh, uh, you know, 80% in terms of ethnic diversity behind the camera as well. Um, that was all important and followed through to the second film. The, we spent all the donations also on uh, over 80% went to those who come from a uh, diverse backgrounds. We also uh, broadened it out in terms of the way to express what I think we forget sometimes about inclusion is the military community. Uh, we continue to do that. Uh, we don't also often find that they're included uh, in, in our culture properly. Second of all, um, uh, religion as well, uh, to include that. 
often I think that when we talk about religion and spirituality and things like that, it it's not always uh, included. I believe in a in a in a in a nonpartisan way, in a bipartisan way, and I'm not saying the this film is all about that. It's not, but it has elements of it along the way that's not supposed to be bipartisan or nonpartisan. It's inclusive in very purposeful ways throughout the film. And I hope people, whether you are in the military or not, civilian or military, whether you are religious or not, I think you'll find, um, cause I, you know, even though uh, you'll find that it's, it's, it's not, uh, it, that it's not uh, gonna be, if you will, overbearing uh, in those spaces, it's inclusive of it. And I really wanted to expand our conversation about being inclusive by including that element, those two elements, in addition to what we did before with Sky Blossom. And Saida, I think that's really important because um, the more we can be inclusive in inclusivity, <laughs> the better we get and uh, at seeing each other. And um, um, I think I think that was what took a long time in the edit. One example, um, one family uh, sings uh, a church hymn called How Great Thou Art. And I, the only reason why I asked him when I was interviewing him to sing it was because he said the way he gets through as a veteran through his days when it gets tough is to sing i was i took took me back i was like you don't whatever a singer looks like he didn't appear to come across as a singer and uh but he said that's what it is like, oh wow okay so there we were sitting in alaska in his basement um and i just finished interviewing his kids and wife um and he says that and i said oh okay and and you, you know how you do this uh, as an interviewer as well saida so i said oh can you sing me something and he says no. And then he says yes. And he sings How Great Thou Art, which is a, you know, tried and true church hymn. And he does it without a single miss. Notes are right on. Perfect. Here we have this 35-year-old, you know, uh, ranger singing How Great Thou Art. And I th thought, let's put that in the movie because it's just so strong. Uh, in the end, we didn't. Um, and for the reasons I just discussed. We want to include that that's part of their life. We do, and we do it in a different way. But we also want to be inclusive of those who may not walk down that road. And that's totally fine. That's cool, right? Everybody has their space. So when you ask about inclusivity, we were very purposeful um, as you watch the movie. And every frame was thought through. Every sound, every 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 frame actually was 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 very purposefully chosen as I sat with both the sound editor and as I sat with both the film editor, everything we were like, wait, wait, stop that, make it a little bit louder, cut that quarter second off, you know, very purposeful. Absolutely. Let's talk about the fact that you um, had a White House screening. There was a screening of your documentary at the White House uh, just a few weeks ago, I believe. Oh. Tell us all about it and what impact do you feel that your film is likely to have on the government, the legislators, et cetera? We wanted this really to have an impact on society, that there are 50 plus million caregivers. There are 100 million people going through mental health challenges. Um, and we're not talking about it. That was the goal. And when we got accepted to be screened at the White House, along with the First Lady by our side, and you know, that's a, I call it the most exclusive theater in the world because it only has what, 42 seats. And you know, what films get to be screened there along with the First Lady or the President? And um, when they said yes, it, I was so glad that America's White House understood that this topic was that important. Again, it wasn't the fact that it was a left or right issue. It was about this is an American issue. You put it in the, the, in the, in the movie theater at, White, at the White House. I was so glad. 
and you know we had a reception in the east garden the first lady spoke and senator elizabeth dole was there and so many other folks and uh, that that was used to, i still have to pinch myself uh that we were there because of that precedent and then that followed uh with just one or two weeks ago with it being played uh, for uh, at, at the U.S. Capitol, um, right in the theater that sits right underneath the Capitol, and with members of Congress, we had uh, leaders in the caregiving and mental health community. We had two hundred journalists there. Um, also, uh, we had Jay Allen, the uh, from NBC's The Voice, sing. He has the 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 theme song that he sang for us live, and um, again so glad that uh, our U.S. government, no matter which branch, is saying, yes, this is an important topic for our country. And it's, and again, we have a bipartisan uh, support for the, for the film. Uh, when we played at the U.S. Capitol, we had both Republicans and Democrats that came on as honorary co-chairs together. That is so important. And I, I hope that, you know, my mom as a school teacher would always say, well, you know, I started uh, uh, speaking out, uh, speaking at events, whatever. And I was like, mom, why are people wanting to hear from me? And uh, I always worry that people start rolling their eyes back or they fall asleep. And she said, uh, you know, so long as you reach one, you're okay. And uh, I think we've reached one or two. And from the messages that we've gotten so far, Saida, uh, I had just have not seen so many folks give their heart and say, thank you. Um, I feel seen now. And that's the beginning of getting better and feeling stronger is it feel seen. So many are at home taking care of somebody and feel like they're all alone. Now, I know it's uh, been shown in theaters, PBS, uh, various locations, venues, but if you haven't seen it, where can you see the documentary? Uh, it is streaming exclusively uh, until the end of July on PBS, um, and then you can see it on PBS Passport after that. You can see it on, uh, as well right now, Amazon Prime. And um, later in the year, uh, it will go to Peacock, we believe, at the moment. That's our plan. And so you can stream it anywhere you'd like. Um, and we hope that you take the time to see it. And we would appreciate it if you do take the time to see it. Absolutely. And, and also, let, 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 let folks know what you think about it. Go to IMDb. Go to Rotten Tomatoes. Let people know what you think. And that... You know, when, when we put in those uh, reviews, I didn't know that meant so much to uh, how a film moves. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new at this business, but you putting in your, your ratings on those two places really does help. Well, thank you so much for making this important documentary and for taking the time out of your very busy day to speak with us here at American Stories. Thank you, Saida. I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us for this edition of American Stories. I'm Saida Pagan. Blink once. If you recognize me, blink once. Oh, you still recognize me, little old me, huh? One, no, I see you're still stretchy, too. He's still in there, and he's still enjoying us. My father wanted to become a youth pastor, but it just wasn't enough to support the family. So he became a social worker, and my mom an elementary school teacher in some of the most difficult schools. They did not pick well-paying jobs. There was a sacrifice. We were on food stamps, but it's the way they wanted to do it. It's been super instructive for me, this quiet lesson, right? You need to live the way you want others to live. You dig it? Hey, Pastor Louie? <laughs>